27 different nationalities that have their largest population in L.A. outside of their country of origin. You can travel the world in L.A. And why not do it through art? Why not do it through culture? Why not do it uh, in a way that actually helps to bridge those different communities? And so, you know, in the time that I went up and down the state, there were a couple things that people talked a lot about. Yes, they talked about the arts, but they also talked about equity. The days when we build five freeways in one neighborhood like we did on the east side are over. Um, and when we mitigate, we ought to mitigate like we do in Beverly Hills and West Hollywood for the east side and the south side. We ought to make sure that the arts are a major component or, you know, a component of what we do. Uh, and so uh, I was asked to come to say, uh, you have an opportunity. Look, you are the cultural workers, the artists, the, the folks who, who really are passionate about this, who understand you don't need me to tell you that the arts can be a bridge, that it could connect communities. You know that uh, better than anyone like me. I'm certainly not an artist. Um, but what I can tell you is that I support uh, funding for the arts. And, you know, I've always, over the years, I think some of you know, again, those of you old enough to remember, I came out of the movement. I wasn't this guy that worked for politicians for 30 years and then ran. I came out of the Chicano movement. I helped found the UMAS. I led the walkouts at my high school. I was involved at UCLA when they tried to close the affirmative action programs, and I said, hold it. You let me in. I'm going to keep the door open and make sure the next generation gets to come in as well. And so what I can tell you is that if you want that funding, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to knock on those doors. Yes, the MTA does have an arts program, but we want it to reflect the neighborhoods that these trains and you know, buses go through. We want it to reflect the aspirations, the struggles, the dreams of our com diverse communities that are in this, uh, you know, city and in the state. Going to be 400,000 direct and indirect jobs uh, related to this Infrastructure Act. Most of it are going to be construction jobs. But there has to be work for the creative workers as well. What we've said is, and what I did when I was mayor, is I said, hold it. These construction unions, I don't see LA here. I'd go to a construction uh, site and ask, where are you from? Temecula, Palm Desert, San Diego, Arizona, Nevada. We changed that. We said, we want to hire locally. We want local hire. We want to focus on high, um, you know, high poverty, high unemployment districts. We want to make sure there are women on construction sites, that the Latinos aren't just laborers, but they work in all the fields, that there are African Americans on uh, our construction sites. And as a result, we went from basically uh, very little, I don't know the exact number, to 2,500 black apprentices. But that's not enough. We need to make investments. And I would submit to you that you have to argue that we need to make investments around creative and cultural workers as well. So you can go on. I didn't read any of it, but let's see, where are we? How we might overcome division and work together across sectors. Yeah, I went, I went through that. Keep on going. Um, I'm supposed to introduce somebody. Uh, oh, I know what I wanted to say. You know, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't like reading speeches. I, li I like them to come from the heart. And, and thank you, Gustavo, for that very generous introduction. I do remember uh, that event. I, I was shining shoes. They, they keep on saying the million dollar. Uh, it, it was in front of, um, it was on 7th of Broadway, actually. I did shine shoes in front of the million dollar, but mostly it was on 7th of Broadway. And then when I got pushed out by the bigger kids, it was in front of Woolworths, and most of you don't remember what a Woolworths was, but for, this, for those of us who are older, Woolworths, nobody wanted to get their shoes shined there. So, you know, 
I had a bad Saturday those days. But what I can tell you is that um, those stories need to be told. The stories of the struggles, the trials and tribulations of our folks. And so I wanted to be here to welcome to the stage Jennifer, is it Vides? Vides? Vides. Ah, Latina. Guatemalteca. Huh? Oaxaca. Guanaca. Aha, Jennifer Vides. She's Metro's first chief customer experience officer. Now, let me just say this. What we need to say to Metro, Metro does it better than anyone, is we need to replicate this. We need to build this uh, bigger and brighter. And I think with your work, with this summit, uh, we're going to be able to do that. And then we need to go up and down the state because a lot of these projects don't have an arts component. And we got to make sure that it does. Because when we do, we'll really celebrate what makes California uh, great. It's that we come from every corner of the earth where the hopes and dreams and often our struggles. And we come to come together uh, to make it a better place. Thank you so much. Enjoy the summit. And now, Jennifer Vives. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. And thank you, Mayor Villarreal Grossa, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, my name is Jennifer Vides, and I am Metro's first Chief Customer Experience Officer, and I'm responsible for driving a customer-centric culture at Metro that will improve the experience for our customers. Functionally, I oversee things like marketing and public relations. I also oversee the Ambassador Program, and I don't know if anybody of you have heard about the Metro Ambassador Program. I oversee that as well. Uh, but I also oversee our Arts and Community Enrichment Programs that he mentioned earlier. And I'm thrilled to be joining you as the moderator for this panel today. As you heard, Metro Art enhances the customer experience. It, up, it uplifts the human spirit with award-winning visual and performing arts that connects people, it connects sites, it connects neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles County. Did you know that you can find locally commissioned art installed at every metro rail station in other parts of our system? Our recent completion of the Regional Connector Transit Project, three new metro stations with eight permanent commissioned artworks are not only elevating the customer experience, but also reflect our diverse communities. They bolster our reputation as the creative capital of the world. Artists are the architects, designers, and creatives that support the work that we do. And by the way, I should note that the art from the uh, Regional Connector was also noted by the New York Times. And when have you ever seen the New York Times write something glowingly positive about Los Angeles? <laughs> You're welcome. When we think of infrastructure, it is also vital to remember that creative human infrastructure is the key to success for major projects like the Sixth, the Sixth Street Viaduct and the Regional Connector and Metro system in general. What they have in common is the bridges that were built through meaningful partnerships with local artists, community-based organizations, and government agencies to better serve our communities towards a more prosperous future. With that, I'm so excited to, to introduce our panelists. Please welcome Rachel Moore, who is the President and CEO of the Music Center. Dr. Ryan J. Smith, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at Community Coalition. Jonathan Munoz Pru, Artistic Director at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And Sue Bell Yank, Executive Director of Clock Shop. as we get situated. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, start by talking about the core of what this conversation is about, which is partnerships. Um, collaboration is often cited as a key to success, especially for nonprofit organizations. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how your organizations have leveraged partnerships to fill gaps and achieve the mission. So you know, let's just have a conversation. I don't know if anybody here wants to be the hand raiser to start that, but what I'll go ahead. <laughs> so, 
So, you know, the Music Center, our facilities uh, are county owned. And because of that, um, we feel that we have not just a legal but a moral obligation to serve everybody in LA County. And um, you know, our, our vision is to deepen the cultural life of every resident of LA County, and that's a huge mission, vision. And the only way we could ever come close to achieving it is by having fantastic partnerships across the board. We won't be successful unless we partner. And so we look to, you know, when we do our big events, when we have Dance DTLA, when we have very special arts, we collaborate with artists, we collaborate with Metro, we collaborate um, with all sorts of organizations because without it, we can't do it. Um, and I think that no single institution can represent the multiplicity of voices across the county. So the only way we can come close is by partnering with folks. I, I guess I'll go next. Um, I work for an organization, Community Coalition, that believes um, very deeply in partnerships. But first, I want to say this. Thank you, Gustavo and Arts for LA team for a really amazing morning. Um, I feel very, very inspired. And uh, you know, it's uh, Fang Lu Hamer who said, nobody's free until everybody's free. So I'm reminded of our collective um, freedom that we need to fight for. So whether we're fighting for the creative arts, whether we're fighting for wages, whether we're fighting um, for expression, whether we're fighting against censorship, whether we're fighting for our collective liberation amongst communities, we all are in a collective fight together. And that to me is important when I think about coalitions. LA is a coalition town. A community coalition uh, was started and founded 30 years ago by uh, Mayor Karen Bass to fight for the social and economic conditions of folks in South LA. And 30 years later, we're still fighting. Um, but we could not fight um, those efforts if we weren't partnering with our brothers and sisters on the east side, if we weren't recognizing the struggle that was happening in the East Valley, if we didn't recognize what was happening in Pico Union and us working together. It's an undertold story in LA that communities work across sectors. They work across physical boundaries in order to make change. And I hope that as, you know, in this inflection point for the city and the country, that we're thinking about how we deepen our connections more and more and more. Um, so it's not just about us partnering, but it's us seeing ourselves in um, our partners and us working together um, across difference in order to achieve our goals. And this is the important time to do so. All right, I'll go next. I see a wall of black, so I think there are people out there, so hello. Uh, we can't see any of you. Um, Jonathan Munoz Pru from the LA LGBT Center. Um, partnership is such an integral part of how we do our work um, for a lot of reasons, but it started when I stepped into the role as artistic director a year and a half ago, and I inherited a budget for one year of programming of two theaters and two art galleries, a budget of eight thousand dollars <laughs> and I thought well <laughs> this is quite the challenge and we had this vision of of having a robust calendar of programming like the music center like cat UCLA like red cat we wanted to be a date night every night of the week for our community so what we did was partnership we reached out and partnered with 20 different uh, arts nonprofits over the course of a year and through partnership, we were able to increase our attendance from pre-pandemic levels of 3,500 a year to this year, just since February, bringing 8,000 patrons to our art center. And 55% of those patrons are first-time attendees who are building new audiences in partnership with our partners. Um, I know there are other questions, but I'm going to briefly highlight some um, key pieces of partnership. First, of course, is financial. We're able to uh, produce programming with less of an investment. Uh, we can stretch our, you know, it's more than 8,000 now, but we can stretch our money uh, that would have been maybe four productions to being 150 events per year. The second is, of course, attendance. We're able to not only market to our core audience, but we're able to introduce ourselves to new audiences to us through all of our 20 plus partners. And the third, which I find most exciting personally as a, a new leader, is an organizational uh, culture piece where we get the privilege of being in partnership with so many other organizations. Some are larger, some are smaller, and we learn how other folks do the work. 
and we borrow from them what resonates with us, and they borrow from us what resonates with them. And it's this mutually beneficial way of, of learning from each other over the course of a season. Hi, everybody. My name is Sue Bell Yank. I'm executive director of Clock Shop, and um, feel like the maybe the small organization representative up here. But um, I mean, our org is really uh, our mission is to work with artists to create a connection between communities and public land here in Los Angeles. Um, we do that by commissioning artists. We also hold an annual kite festival at. LA State Historic Park, one of the very few urban California state parks. And our organization over the last 10 years has really been defined by that partnership with California State Parks. We recently became an official cooperating association with um, state parks and uh, you know, it really came down to a relationship that was created as we saw major river rev revitalization um, threatening in our Northeast LA neighborhoods and a 18 acre swath of raw undeveloped land known as the Bowtie right next to the river which was slated to become a state park but had sat vacant for 20 years. Um, it was very much used by the community but there wasn't really a lot of momentum to have that become a park um, or pressure and so really what we did was enter into a relationship, and that's ultimately what these partnerships always are. It's a trust-building exercise, and it's a relationship exercise, and understanding what can we give to each other. So, you know, that, that initial relationship and partnership in 2014 led to over 90 public programs and artists commissioned temporary projects on that site over the course of, nine, of 10 years almost, which then led to a $10 million grant from the Department of the Interior to start the process of construction on that site, which will begin in 2024. So, you know, we were a beneficial partner to California State Parks because we were able to bring in um, a whole coalition of other community partners to program and work on that site, and they became a crucial partner to us in terms of creating that connection and being able to um, see through our mission of, of connecting uh, communities in Los Angeles to public space. So a lot of partnership going on up here. Um, just for context, before I, in my past life, before being in um, public transportation, I was in public television, and we once did some market research where co customer researchers, folks told us that, you know, they loved, what they loved about LA was just how it's like a mashup of cultures, like your unique neighborhood, neighborhood by neighborhood, you know, we, the Korean taco came from LA, right? So, you know, when it comes to partnerships, you could always go for you know the most obvious thing, or you could find new, interesting, compelling partnerships that nobody would have thought of. Do any of you have any examples of partnerships that you know maybe seemed like they weren't obvious, but that came up and were successful? I'll jump in and, and offer perhaps a different answer and say I don't. Um, as a leader, as a curator, I'm not right now curating or choosing what projects, I'm not leaning into what interests me. A lot of the way these conversations begin is me and my team identifying who are we in service of, who, do, who are we supposed to be in service of, because we're usually not serving the people we're, we're, we say we're serving. And then we go to leaders in that community, whether it be a BIPOC community, a, a senior community, a youth community, whatever it might be, our, our, our neighbors down the street. And, and the conversation um, rooted in a consensus organizing methodology usually begins like this. We say, um, uh, we'd, love to be in, we'd love to be in community with you. Uh, we recognize that though we've been here for 25, 30 years, fill in the blank, um, you haven't always been in the room. And I believe that's not because you don't know we're here. It's not a game of better marketing. It's because you know you're here and you're choosing to not come into the space. So we would like to be in service of you. What would you like on your, thir on your theaters? And what would a relationship look like to you? And uh, I think in 2018 at my last job, um, we had about 150 of those conversations in one year at A Noise Within in Pasadena. And it's the community telling us what they want us doing. And usually they want to do that work with us and put their folks on stage. And so it's led by listening and leaning into what folks want to bring to us. 
I was just going to offer another methodology because I completely agree with that. And um, for me, this process of deep listening uh, in, in, in advance of a truly meaningful partnership is crucial. And so one thing that Clock Shop is undertaking right now, we just launched a cultural atlas project. And really the impetus of that was around the future development of this park and wanting future programming and also, you know, equity around the park to be addressed in these neighborhoods that are undergoing extremely rapid change in gentrification and erasure right now. Um, and so it really became a storytelling and oral history project um, to both, you know, capture and explore the stories of these local communities um, to be told at the park, you know, and through programming, but also um, to inform our direction and what is going to be relevant as we move forward as a programming partner. And so, you know, a very similar kind of process, but another method um, through which a storytelling process can el elicit and already has elicited strong future partnerships, I think, that will unfold over time. Yeah. I think Rachel um, has yeah. something. So, um, we, um, in terms of partnerships and, and approaches to partnerships, um, a number of years ago, we started something called the Partner uh, Network Initiative, and it's um, a group of uh, sort of community organizers and arts and culture leaders that we wanted to partner with over the long term and really build a relationship because, frankly, as a larger institution, there's a lot of skepticism on our um, authenticity, let's put it, put it that way, and we wanted to work with really wonderful people who could serve as a think tank and be co-creators um, on a lot of projects. And we know, you know, partnership and trust take a lot of time, and so we didn't want it to be just a one-year deal or a two-year deal. We, we, we are building something for the long term, and so we're very excited about that work, um, and it's really helped us um, to, you know, work with long-term partners and co-create as opposed to, um, you know, bringing in task force or once in a while. And it's, it's been really fruitful for us. I'll, I'll probably build on this theme around uh, community organizing and deep listening. So we are a community organizing institution. We knock on doors. And I will say, to be truthful, I believe in the power of, of community organizing. I believe in the power of working in community. I believe we have to be responsive um, to the communities that we're working with. And we actually have a dynamic arts and culture department that really thinks about art building as a way to build power. Um, how many artivists are out there, by the way? Folks who are doing this work um, to, to change um, social conditions. Like, that work is important. It's very powerful, particularly in this moment. So I'll, I'll give an example. We just had um, a huge power fest where we uh, were able to partner with the Crenshaw Baldwin Hills Mall. Um, we brought dynamic artists um, to come, um, if, you know the, if you know the rapper No Name, um, we had amazing poets. Um, we were able to do a South LA is Still Home exhibition of South LA artists talking about displacement and what it means to ensure that South LA is built for black and brown residents who continue um, to live there. And um, it was an opportunity to remind folks that not only can artists and community organizers and teachers and educators and community members work together, we can actually speak truth to power together through our collective voices, through our work, through our efforts. Um, and the youth who were a part of our Arts Council were the ones who led the conversation around the connection between arts and community. So, I believe in deep partnership. I believe we can work within communities to partner. I think we can work across communities to partner. And the last thing I'll say, um, because your point I thought was really important, is that as we think about resources, we often talk about the issues of equity. How many folks have um, been in a conversation yesterday about equity? How many of us believe that when we talk about equity, we all have the same definition of equity? Can you imagine this? Billions of dollars are being spent on this issue of equity and not three hands were raised that we have a common definition. So I will say this, as we think about partnership, we need to be providing resources to the highest need communities here in Los Angeles, and that includes the arts, includes the arts. That 
we are limited in what we can do, but if we're not making sure that that is directed to the people who often aren't able to go to museums, who often are not asked what they value in art, who are often not asked how they can express themselves, then what is the work that we're doing? So if we're going to talk about equity, we're going to talk about action. If we're going to talk about action, we're going to talk about making sure our work gets to the highest need communities here in Los Angeles. Of course. At, at very briefly, I was uh, at a, a preview of one of our shows, and you know, there's a lot of ideas of, of how one should behave in the theater and what the expectation is. And there was a, a young uh, couple in the back row, and the play started, and they took out of their bags two Four Locos, and they cracked them open and started drinking, and then they took out a bag of Cheetos, and they started eating their Cheetos. And I thought, this is a great chance to practice uh, supporting how people show up to the theater and meeting people where they're at. <laughs> Four locals, okay. Love that. So um, there's, we have different organizations of different size here on this panel. So I just wanted to, you know, reflect on, you know, Rachel, you mentioned something about um, the music center and how the authenticity might be questioned or whatever because of the size. So what are for the smaller organizations? Like, what are the challenges that you might face that that you know that it might be different? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that exists on any scale. I mean, we're we're certainly larger than some individual people we might be talking to, or or have different kinds of capacity, you know, than other folks we might partner with. And so, I think it's really, really important to keep that in mind. Um, I'm thinking specifically about our ongoing relationships with First Peoples of Tovangar, which is very important. Tovangar being the Tongva word for where we are now. Um, and, you know, when we're dealing with public land, obviously that kind of relationship is, is crucial. Um, we have varying different levels of capacity than some of the folks or organizations or families that we might be working with. And so, I mean, to me, it's really about um, that listening process, being extremely transparent um, about what it is that we have to offer and, um, and reorienting ourselves, I think, in terms of thinking about the sovereignty of the land and how we can be in support. Um, so, you know, and still be true to our mission. So there's, there's many layers to it, and I think that that happens through conversation, that happens through trust building, um, and being super transparent about what we're looking for, what our values are, what our agenda might be, and just laying it out all on the table. Um, I think when we're, when we're in partnership with larger organization, governmental institutions or, um, or other larger arts organizations who we've also part partnered with in the past, I think that the same, you know, really the same tenets apply, like, like transparency, relationship building over time, um, I think often the, the issues that can become really taxing, especially for a small organization, is an insistence on arbitrary deadlines um, or, you know, when time or financial uh, resources become very tightened for whatever reason and that f might feel arbitrary to the process, that can really create a lot of friction. So I think having that kind of really open trust and relationship up front and, and making sure that um, you're being communicated with very, very frequently too, um, that can often smooth out any of those issues that might arise. Um, credit is another big one. I would just put that out there. Sometimes we forget, you know, to, to give credit to all of the participants in a project or to all of the institutions or partners that might have worked on it. As much as we try, it's, it's easy to forget. So um, I think that that's always a good thing to keep in mind. Anyone else? If not, go ahead. Well, I guess um, the, the one thing I will say, we're an organization of about 35 folks um, that often is being asked to quote unquote punch above our weight, meaning do a lot with the little resources. And particularly after the pandemic, it feels like the nonprofit sector, folks who are supporting youth, those in education are being asked to do more with less. 
um, are asked to um, actually repair a lot of harm that has happened um, with not enough resources and not enough time. And I think what when we think about our work, we think about a couple things. One, how do we ensure we're always doing the work that's going to be most impactful? And um, sorry to philanthropy, not what philanthropy thinks is most impactful, even though I think it's important. Um, but what we actually see on the ground, um, particularly from um, our community members and our partners think that are, that are impactful and important, because I think oftentimes if we're going to do the work, it has to be work that wins over hearts and minds. It has to be work um, that's actually making material conditions better. And if we're not talking about that, then we wonder if this is the work um, that we should be doing. And, you know, shout out, I will say to our philanthropic partners, thank you for funding us. And in this post-pandemic world, we should be thinking about how we work with our nonprofit profits to think differently about how we're holding folks accountable, how we're collecting data, how we're thinking differently about North Stars, because a lot of that work actually guides us to not do the meaningful work that we actually see needs to be done in community. I'll, I'll add to this. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I will add to this. Uh, the center is is unique because uh, we're a very we're we're a larger organization than most of the folks we partner with. We have ten buildings and over eight hundred employees. Um, but the cultural arts department that leads the art center is a staff of three: myself and two other people. Um, so there's a lot of assumptions. Uh, well, first I'll say that any three people leading any arts organization, it's hard. It's it's very very hard. <laughs> so I, I I appreciate that uh, that you all may be experiencing. Um, I will also say that because we're connected to the center our partners oftentimes assume a machinery and an infrastructure that doesn't yet exist. So for me, it, it's less of a size question, a small or large organization, but more of a systems and, and infrastructure question because we have amazing ingredients at the center. We have a marketing department. We have a development department, but they have not yet in our history done that work in service of arts and culture. So even though it's there, it's not easy to pull all those levers. So that is a, a, a interesting place we, we um, access we're on. And I'll also say that as a larger organization in the sense that we are in partnership with a lot of, of collaborators, we have the benefit of a bird's eye view and data collection of how all these arts organizations are doing compared to each other. We've, we're, we're able to take that data and share that data with our individual partners so they can see a larger ripple in the ecosystem. And one of the obvious ways that shows up is when we're building budgets together. We have made a commitment recently, this year, to pay um, 50 percent towards all of our partnerships, even though um, well, there's a lot of reasons that hadn't happened before, but we want to um, justify a 50-50 revenue share at the end of the relationship. So we're committed to that investment. And part of how that looks is we look at um, what our partners are paying their artists, and we sometimes say, look, we are actually going to give you more money to pay your director double or triple because we see across all of these relationships that's on the low end of what folks are paying. So anyone who's working in this sandbox, we want to sort of create some continuity among the artist's experience and take away at our, at our building. So Rachel, I wanted to direct this one to you. Um, you know, you and I work for, well, we look larger, larger organizations, um, and we often have, well, right. <laughs> yes, and so we are often looking for, people are often looking for our, to get our attention, right, to partner. So what would you say um, to, uh, you know, smaller organizations who are looking to partner with you about how to, how to get your attention or how to bring forth the ideas for partnership, right? So like if we have smaller organizations that really are trying to uplift their cause, what's the best way or ways? Yeah, well, I, I would say part of it goes back to this partner network initiative is that by working with people who have lots of ties with people in the community, it bubbles up that way so that you know people understand the, the work that we're trying to do. And we have, you know, I have a staff that reaches out all the time and is always has their ear to the ground and wants to, um, you know, uplift lots of different voices. And we know that's only through partnerships. So I think that we're very open to that. But I think it's also partnering with our long-term partners who really understand their communities well so that we can serve um, 
you know, make sure that they're supported in their efforts in a way that really does help them, and it's not just about what we think will help them. Um, so it, I think it's uh, keeping our ear to the ground and then par working with terrific people who have a lot of knowledge. So I'm being given the five-minute sign, which means we should probably go around now, and if there's one thing that you would like to share with our audience, one piece of advice about partnerships, what would, what would that be? developing good partnerships. I'll jump, I'll jump in and say um, I, I am certainly a believer in partnership. I hope I will continue doing this and I hope you all do as well. And I also don't want to roman romanticize partnership. It is so much harder than not partnering. It is really, really messy and requires so much over communication and requires a different level of accountability and collision of organizational cultures. And um, you are going to make mistakes and feel bad and have to be accountable. And there's a lot of relationship repair, 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 repair. Um, so it is a different project than, than producing an event. It is a lot of relationship, but it is well worth the investment. I think something that um, helped uh, my team and I think through this is, is setting up our own core values around how we want to partner with folks. And sometimes those are you know, specific to different organizations or to engaging with tribal first peoples, for example, or um, community organizations, and really holding ourselves accountable to those values and checking in on them over time, you know, one of our values is to take time and not be um, beholden to like arbitrary deadlines and funding structures <laughs> um, with our partnerships, you know, which we're committed to over over the long term. And so, um, but you know, we have to check ourselves on that constantly because those pressures come in from all all different places, and we have to kind of ask ourselves, okay, are we are we rushing this? Are we moving this forward too quickly? You know, is this actually the right time? To be, um, to be embarking on this together or do we need to take a pause and have more conversation? So I think that setting for your team really intentionally kind of how, how do we approach and enter into those partnerships and then it carries through, you know, everybody in the organization can kind of hold those values and hold each other accountable when we, when we enter into those kinds of, um, you know, truly meaningful and authentic and long-term partnerships. I would completely agree with that, that um, it starts with your values and learning to live your values in the good times and the bad times is very hard and takes time and sometimes you have to step back and take a breath. Um, we really seek to you know, question ourselves. Are we living our values at this moment? Are we making a value-based choice? We want to work from a moral center. Sometimes the answers aren't as obvious as they seem in a textbook. And um, it, it takes time and listening and forgiveness. I'll, I'll just say this. Um, we're in a dynamic room of folks who are upholding the artistic and creative economy here in Los Angeles. So I'd be remiss to say, we want to partner with you. Um, um, we, you know, as we are investing in brilliant black and brown youth, um, amazing community members in South Central Los Angeles, um, a place that often um, is a cultural center that is ignored. Um, I want to say, please, please open your doors um, to communities like ours, and we want to partner, and we also want to meet you where you're at. So I'll, I'll say that, and um, I will. I will end on this. You know, Bayard Rustin says every group needs. Um, every community needs a group of angelic troublemakers, and he was an out queer black man in the 1960s um, who, who really built and was the architect of the March on Washington. And I will say, if there was ever a time where um, the arts are under attack and our human rights are under attack, now is the time. We need artists to run for office. We need artists who are community organizers. We need artists who are fighting for our communities now more than ever and fighting against censorship and fighting against empowerment. We, I want to see my next assembly member um, being able to pick up a mic and a pen and a paper and say we can work together um, in a lot of mediums to change the conditions that we see. So please run for office. I will vote for you. Um, I'll even run your campaign. Um, and I'm really excited. Thank you all. Thank you all for the work that you do. And Dr. Smith gets the last word. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. We're at time.
Hello. Oh. Woohoo! Take two. That was great, babes. That was lovely. Everybody. All right, y'all doing okay out there? All right, I've got some instructions, and I'm going to take it a little slower because I it's, it's, a, it's a lot of bit a little. It's a lot. Whatever. So good, right? Um, all right, so we're going to take a little breaky poo. We're going to break out into our segments, our breakout segment rooms. Um, do you, do you all have your little lanyards on you? My little love angel music babies? Everybody have their lanyards? Okay, so if you have a red lanyard, we're going to take a little break too, by the way, but we're, we were having too much fun. So now we went from 15 minutes to five minutes. So um, if you have a red lanyard, you will stay in this theater for a panel on bold approaches to equitable funding. <laughs> Fun. Um, are we good, my reds? Okay, cool. If you have a blue lanyard, where are my blues at? My little cool blues. Um, you're going to return to the main entrance and be guided to a fireside chat on community engagement with LA28. Wowee! Are we good, my blues? Does that sound good? Okay, cool. Where are my orange lanyards? Woo! Woo! Yeah! My uh, friend Quinta says orange. I'm like, orange? And, and pillow instead of pillow. Anyways, um, uh, you will go to the third floor auditorium. That's right. To hear from our, uh, from our reimagined leadership panel. And uh, yeah, that's it. Basically, there's people in the back with crew of volunteers with uh, red shirts, uh, red arts advocate shirts, ready to help you find your way. Um, and we'll see you in a few.